<clears throat> seems it's coming. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. And uh, do you also see my mouse so that I can point somewhere? Yes, I see. I see. Okay. Yes. Shark. Yes. Yes. Very good. So I will uh, tell you about uh, non-adiabatic machine learning molecular dynamics today. And uh, but first, let's start with uh, a little bit more background. Before we started the seminar, we had talked about the different campuses of uh, the university at Sao Paulo. Well. The University of Vienna is not that much scattered, but I focus now on the chemistry. So I usually sit in this building, not now because now I'm at home due to the lockdown. And you see, uh, this is where I sit. So if you ever come to Vienna, uh, just to stop by there, you see this is a building, it's okay. Uh, but this is the main uh, faculty of chemistry, the main building where we uh, sometimes uh, need to go to teach and uh, this is a few hundred meters away and this looks much more representative let's say <laughs> but uh, in winter it's much better to be here because it's much warmer <laughs> okay so with whom do I usually work here you have already met uh, Sebastian and he's also here today so you see him here and of course uh, the head of the group is uh, Leticia Gonzalez and um, so it's a, a rather big group, I would say. And um, much of the work I uh, will be presenting today is uh, done also in uh, collaboration with uh, Julia Westermeyer, who did her B PhD with me on all these uh, things that I am going to tell you today about. So that's why she is here. Basically, the output of uh, this uh, fancy neural network with all these people. But everybody contributes somehow, we interact a lot, and that is a lot of fun. Okay, so besides uh, machine learning for excited states, I do a lot of other stuff, but uh, I'm not going to tell you about it, just to give you some idea what else have I done, and I want to. Uh, particularly to mention shark with the excited state dynamics on uh, nucleo base derivatives so where I share a very nice paper with Antonio. So thanks for inviting me and uh, uh, thank you also for this nice couple collaboration. And uh, now I will start because I assume not everybody knows about machine learning, how this exactly works. I will start from the basics uh, with a brief introduction to machine learning. And then I will go to neural networks for nanosecond, excited state dynamics, and uh, neural networks versus kernel rich regression, and something that we call Schnack. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, the first chapter, the brief introduction to machine learning. So. You can ask yourself, machine learning, what has that done for us? And probably you have heard a lot about machine learning in the media. And uh, so, for example, it can create new cat pictures on the internet. And that's very important to humanity, as you probably know. So even if you do not have a cat, uh, you can uh, basically draw a cat yourself in such a frame. So you see my artistic skills are not so good with uh, when I just use a mouse uh, to uh, draw. Obviously, a mouse is not a good idea to draw cats, right? And uh, then the machine learning does something, and it creates uh, a nice cat from your drawing. And uh, well, whether it's nice, uh, you can decide for yourself. For, to me, it looks both uh, dead and alive. And uh, yeah, speaking of uh, dead and alive cats, you immediately come to machine learning for quantum chemistry, right? So what do we want to go to do here? It is, um, we want to accelerate uh, the most time consuming parts of our simulation. So the ab initial calculations usually. And uh, so in our case, we want to pre predict potential energies with machine learning. And uh, so for many cases of uh, replace the expensive uh, sol uh, solving of the Schrodinger equation by something which looks uh, complicated at first, but in the end is very, very simple. So let's see how simple it really is. So um, here, 
Let's start with uh, something that you probably have learned at school. So this is uh, just the equation for a linear curve. So y is uh, uh, w times x plus b, which gives you a straight line. And uh, now, usually in school, you call this thing slope and this thing intercept. And in machine learning, you would go ahead and give different names to the things. So weights and biases. So uh, to make it not too easy to follow this stuff. And then what we want to do now is uh, if we have some data points, you think, well, probably I can fit a straight line through uh, these data points, but uh, it's probably not this red one here. So how do I get uh, the red one that I've just guessed to be exactly the one that uh, goes through these points? Well, that's my task, to find an optimal W and an optimal B. And I can do a least squares fit. So what I do is I start with the error. So my blue Y minus my red Y. Uh, there's a difference here, and I want to make this smaller. So and uh, instead of just taking this error, which would be just this difference here, I take the difference squared and take one half of it. And uh, this is something I want to minimize. I want to make it smaller. How do I do that? Well, if I look at this function, it looks like a parabola, right? So um, here's my parabola. And I start somewhere where the value of my parabola is high. And uh, that means I'm far off uh, being close to the data points with my straight line. So now I try to go down the slope of uh, this parabola, just like we do in geometry optimization uh, for quantum chemistry. Uh, it's the same thing, actually. And uh, I go further down. And this is an approach uh, that is called gradient descent. And the further I go down, the closer I get to my solution. And then if I'm at the minimum of my uh, error function, my loss function, I call this in machine learning, then I have found the best solution. OK. In principle, you probably know that. And uh, now this is linear regression. So how do we go from there to something like a neural network, a machine learning algorithm? You see, this is a very simple equation. We have one input, uh, we multiply it with a number, we add another number, and we get yet another number. So let's make it more complicated. Instead of inserting one input, we take several ones, as many as we have dimensions in our input. D. So already the uh, equation looks a little bit more complicated. We have just more of these terms. And uh, this is not enough. Let's make it even more complicated. Let's uh, take this. The sum, of course, gives you a number. And let's insert that into another function, for example, the hyperbolic tangent. And uh, then this, of course, gives you yet another number, which now you still call y. So it's your output. And this is something you would call a neuron. And uh, now what is a neural network? It is, of course, uh, many of those neurons together. So here, again, you see you have different x's, and you have one b here inside. You have the w's that are in here. So the d in this picture would be 3, and you get one y out. And you see the resemblance with this thing that we all have in our bodies, these uh, neural cells. It's uh, meant to mimic that, but in a very, very simple way. So now, if you put uh, many of these together, of course, you need several sums. And I've hidden an error in this equation. So it's time for you to wake up and think about uh, what is wrong in this equation. And uh, tell me if you, if you know, if you find out. Let's see. If anybody sees it, so I 
take basically a visual uh, approach to see this. So what we have here, you see, we have uh, two of these neurons, which uh, are here, and they enter three other neurons, which are you see here. So that is another input, Z in that case, and uh, multiplied with uh, some weights gives us the output. If I want to have always these neurons, what is missing here is another bias. So, and uh, this is something you do not see in these uh, schemes very often. So very often the bias is just uh, left out. So just for you to know, well, in principle, you, we started with this linear regression, which looks very simple and you just do the same thing all over again and uh, after a while it looks very complicated but in the end it's just a lot of this with uh, some additional functions that we call activation functions so if you have any questions uh, just interrupt me okay so this is a neural network this is how it works numbers in number out Okay, so how do we try train now our neural network? Well, we have this thing that I've shown you on the last slide. And now we do something very similar to the linear regression training that I've uh, shown you before. We start with uh, here a neural network. And now what is the thing that we want to change? These are these weights, right? So these are the things we can adapt in a neural network. And how do we change them? We change them in a way that this error gets smaller. So if we take random weights here and we calculate uh, what is the outcome, for example, if our inputs are some positions of atoms and our output should be some energy, then if you just take random weights, it will be completely wrong, of course, because how should uh, multiplying random numbers with uh, the coordinates of uh, um, some atoms give you the right quantum chemistry number, the right quantum chemistry energy? It does not. So these weights have to, vary, to be very specific and uh, so you minimize the difference between these two things. So you minimize this difference here. And uh, so we learn from making this difference small. And if we do that, you see that the neural network adapts uh, these weights and the difference gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And at some point, uh, you have really achieved uh, the same value as your quantum chemistry tells you. And uh, afterwards, uh, you take additional geometries of your molecule and uh, get points for these values very fast because the neural network is very fast. So that's essential. So there's a training step and a prediction step always in machine learning, at least in supervised machine learning that we are doing. Okay. So um now let's talk about a, a different approach of machine learning i've told you about a neural network a simple neural network so far now let's talk also about something called kernel rich regression let's go back to the linear regression formula so you see this is the one we had before, and I ha can have uh, different inputs and different outputs. So I have put an index i now here. And uh, here again is now our neuron, and I've put here different indices again. And now what is different, you see we had complicated our uh, equation by taking more of these x and all this together put as the input to some nonlinear function. And in kernel reg regression, you'd kind of make it the other way around. You put your x uh, 
into some nonlinear function, which you call the kernel function, and then multiply it with some weights, and that's your output. Okay, just to give you an idea. So it's a different type of uh, machine learning method, but uh, in principle, it, uh, there are similar ideas inside. So you make, you take some nonlinear function and you multiply it with uh, some weights. Okay, we'll get to that uh, much later again. Now, let's start uh, with uh, the real science with uh, neural networks for nanosecond excited state dynamics. And uh, so what we want to do is uh, surface hopping excited state dynamics with uh, machine learning. So we have done that uh, uh, with Shark uh, that you've heard about from Sebastian, I think two weeks ago. And uh, so probably you remember this and uh, you see um, I have hidden another error here in this slide, um, or let's say it's slightly outdated. What is uh, the outdated thing? Probably Sebastian has already spotted it. Right now we have already shark 2.1 and not 2.0. And um, so what we want to do is excited state dynamics. And we also want to do that on uh, with uh, machine learning potentials. Okay, so we want to use machine learning for this. Is this a good idea? Uh, you could ask yourself, is using machine learning a good idea? And um, if you look at other examples, for example, a neural network trained on 33,000 jokes, uh, it tells you something like uh, this here. What do you call a cat does it take to screw in a light bulb? They could worry the banana. And say, well, if it does the same thing with our potentials, uh, we will not be very happy, right? But uh, if you uh, leave aside the grammar in this question, indeed, uh, if uh, you want to screw in a light bulb, uh, of this lamp, you could actually worry how this works. Because if this is really bent like this, uh, screwing does not work. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Maybe the machine learning discovers things that we uh, never thought about. So, in principle, let's back up and uh, see what could we, in principle, learn uh, about excited states with machine learning. And uh, usually you probably go ahead, you choose some parameters, do some quantum chemistry, you have some primary outputs, uh, some secondary outputs, some tertiary outputs, and you do anal analysis of all that. So what are these things? So for example, for excited states, you could choose the active space, you could choose uh, density functionals for your TDDFT calculations. Uh, Primary outputs would then be wave functions or densities. Secondary outputs is something you compute from these wave functions uh, once they are converged. Potentials, uh, adiabatic or diabatic, non-adiabatic couplings, spin-orbit couplings, transition dipoles. And if you have these, you can compute tertiary outputs like spectra, rate constants, uh, spin states, and so on. And, uh, of course, you can interpret every one of these. And all of this, in principle, you can also do with uh, machine learning. So, there's a lot of things uh, you can do. And uh, what I mostly do is uh, focus on these adiabatic potentials with machine learning and uh, non-adiabatic couplings and spin-orbit couplings and transition dipoles. So, very much in this range here. Okay, so let's see. So what do we need? We need energies, gradients, non-adiabatic coupling vectors, spin-orbit couplings, and dipole moments if we want to describe all this excited state dynamics. And uh, now this is expensive, 
So if we want now to train a machine learning model, we need to be unfortunately very selective about our data that we use as training data. So it's not really the thing that you always hear, big data, no. Here we want to cherry pick our data and use as little data as possible because obtaining our data is uh, very expensive. It's not like everybody gives you uh, the different potential energies by just uh, using his or her smartphone. Uh, it's like Google does it or Facebook or uh, I don't know which other uh, company. Here we need to cherry pick our data, right? So, well, now the question is which one to pick? And uh, so how do we do this? How do we select the data that we use later on in our machine learning approach? So what we do is something that we call adapt adaptive sampling. And it uh, has been around uh, in similar fashion already before. It's called also query by committee in the machine learning community or grow if you ask Michael Collins, for example. And um, I like to think it uh, about it like a hybrid car, which can run on gasoline and on electricity. So how do I imagine this? We compute some initial data with quantum chemistry. And uh, we have a few points selected, however, and we train neural networks. And uh, the neural networks now give us some potentials. And I run uh, dynamics on these potentials. And I use at least two different neural networks and uh, run the same dynamics on these two different neural network potentials. And uh, so this is like uh, the car that runs on electricity. And it's nice. And uh, after some point, I come into a region where I have never had uh, any quantum chemistry data. So the neural networks, in principle, don't know what to tell you. So they just predict something like random numbers. And of course, these random numbers will be different for the two different neural networks. So these potentials diverge. And if you compare them, then uh, you will know that now you need to do some uh, quantum chemistry again. So the slow and expensive one. And uh, you get some additional points. And uh, you enter them, you retrain your neural networks, you get uh, potentials that are now, now valid at uh, different regions of uh, different geometries. And you do that iteratively until you're happy with your potential, with your machine learning potential. And you say, now I never or very rarely discover that uh, these two give different answers. They always give the same answer. So I have a converged potential. OK, so this is how we cherry pick our data. OK, now. You've seen that this goes sequentially in principle, but we can also do that in parallel because the sampling period, this is basically uh, dynamics with machine learning potentials. This is very fast, this great thing. And then we come into an area where this trajectory, for example, is uh, not happy anymore uh, because the two neural networks predict something different. And uh, we stop and we do a quantum chemistry calculation and uh, then wait. And uh, here is another trajectory which runs in, in parallel. And it comes to a point where these two neural network potentials diverge earlier in the neural network dynamics. But uh, uh, if we start um, a quantum chemistry calculation now, we just wait until all these different quantum chemistry calculations of the different trajectories have finished. And then we collect all these different points and then retrain our model and then continue. Then we can kind of parallelize this as well. And uh, 
So this works quite well. This is uh, what we call adaptive sampling. Philip. Yes. So you have to, to train in your machine for each molecule you want to study. In uh, this case, yes. So if uh, so, this is how we have started for excited states, at least. Um, there are approaches to train um, machine learning models for different molecules at the same time. And if we have enough time, I will also tell you something about this for excited states at the very end. But uh, for now, we choose just one molecule. And uh, uh, basically to do a specific machine learning force field for this very molecule that we've chosen. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, now we have our training data. And, uh, oh yeah, this is what I wanted to, to tell you also. So you see, if you have here a logarithmic uh, um, um, axis with time steps, you see how many additional points you add to your training set. And in the beginning, you add many. And later on, they get less and less because this axis is logarithmic, you see it really gets longer and longer until you uh, really get uh, additional points here. Okay, so now which molecule have we started with? This was the methylene ammonium cation, so this molecule here, and we have altogether like 4000 uh, quantum chemistry points. And now what we need to do is learning of excited state energies. So the number of states uh, is uh, how many uh, outputs we need to have here in neural networks. We want to have the gradients. So we need uh, a lot of outputs. We want non-adiabatic couplings. It's the number of states times the number of states times three. We want spin orbit couplings. We want dipole moments. and. Um, we have done that uh, originally with uh, something called Theano. So this is uh, just a software package uh, to implement uh, neural networks, uh, a rather old one. That was still uh, nice at the time we started with this, but by now is outdated, I would say. And interfaced it with Shark. And uh, now, um, so uh, now I see how do I accept uh, access the chat. I've seen a question. I just need to see how I do this. Okay, here. So uh, Max asks, uh, when you retrain the neural network model, do you still keep all or part of the old samples or just replace everything by the new data? Okay, let's uh, quickly go uh, back uh, here to this thing. We always add here in this step new points. So we still need all the old data. We cannot throw away anything. Uh, otherwise, uh, the whole learning does not work. So we make our training data always larger. And you see it also here. So it's not like uh, we have thrown anything away. This is uh, the number of uh, data points we have in our training set at the end. Okay, so another question. Please go ahead. Who is it, Antonio, or who has uh, raised his or her hand? No, I was just testing. I I asked to the people if you want to make questions, raise your hand because so you can see who if there are questions or not. Okay, it's easier than write straight to the chat. Okay, can you at the bottom line right, uh, levantar a mão? Just press it and your name will be where I can see, okay? So, Do Antonio, you tell me when there is a raised hand? Yes, okay, that's better, so, okay? I think Danilo uh, had uh, raised his hand or not. Have you, Danilo? Yes. Uh, Philippe, uh, do you calculate the non diabetic coupling? Because uh, it is expensive to calculate using quantum mechanical calculations. Yes, in this case, uh, we do this 
we need to do that. So maybe you have heard in the past from Sebastian that uh, uh, shark, when doing quantum chemistry, can circumvent computing non-adiabatic couplings by calculating wave function overlaps. Yes, overlap, yes. In between subsequently wave function, yes. Right. right. So Thank you. we cannot do this here because we do not have a wave function. Okay. So we do not use this approach uh, in this way, but we have other ways. You will see in a few minutes how to get around uh, this non-adiabatic coupling vectors. But for the moment, we, we calculate them and we train them. And this is why we have chosen such a small molecule to start with, because then we can do all these calculations uh, at a rather high level of quantum chemistry and still be quite fast. So this is methylene ammonium. It's uh, similar to ethylene, but without uh, these uh, low-lying Rydberg states. And uh, this is what we have started with as a kind of uh, drosophila, as a kind of uh, yeah test system. OK, now, if we want to compute now these non-adiabatic couplings, for example. We do that with quantum chemistry and uh, do that at uh, different points which are not really linked to each other uh, initially. Uh, we have a problem because uh, probably you know if you have uh, uh, an input in quantum chemistry, you get a wave function and I visualize this now by an orbital, but you all know that the wave function is a little bit more complex than this orbital, I suppose. And uh, now you do that uh, for different states and you have different wave functions here, right? So these are the outputs of your quantum chemistry. And now you calculate uh, the non-adiabatic coupling, for example, or any cap coupling actually. Um, so um, it gives you a value, right? And now you change the geometry. So you have another input and you get uh, different outputs. And you see now uh, whether you have uh, this orbital lobe colored blue or colored red. This uh, depends on your quantum chemistry and is random because uh, the phase of the wave function is uh, not uniquely determined. What is uh, uniquely determined is the square of the wave function. This is something which tells you where the electrons uh, in principle should be. But uh, the wave function itself is not uniquely determined by your Schrodinger equation. So if you take now this and calculate the overlap, you do not see it, uh, but the geometry has changed a little bit from here to here then you will get a different value. But now the phase of this wave function is different uh, from this one. So if I compute something which depends on these two, I get minus uh, the same thing as I had before. Actually, if I had it consistent, this point should be up here. Now it's down here, right? And uh, now I do another uh, geometry, another calculation. And um, I see, again, the quantum chemistry has chosen to take uh, this phase here and that phase uh, for the other state. And I do this and I get a lot of points. And now imagine you are the machine learning. You are the machine learning algorithm. And I ask you, please fit me a line through these points. What would you do? Probably you would do something like this. But in reality, what should be is uh, uh, that it should be somehow smooth. So actually, if you look at uh, this point here now, you should do, you should adjust the phases such that everything is consistent along this path. So you correct uh, this everywhere. And then you get a smooth curve, uh, the one that you really would like to have. Okay. And now imagine if uh, you went back. Uh, 
and along one trajectory you would get this and along another trajectory you would have uh, you would visit the same geometries but have uh, the same value but multiplied with minus one and you present it to the machine learning algorithm so it has very close in space uh, two values which are plus the value or minus the value then what does the machine learning model do probably predict zero right so the average of these so not very good so what we need is to do this phase correction and this is something that we do via these overlaps okay and now we have this post processing of our data and when, then we can continue and train our neural networks and predict potentials and um, so you see these are the potentials uh, just a scan along two coordinates for MSCI so a high level quantum chemistry method and uh, with the neural network and it looks uh, very similar what is uh, different well if you look closely uh, the gap is a little bit smaller here in the quantum chemistry, a little bit larger in the neural networks. So let's see whether this works really also in dynamics. And uh, so we have done dynamics uh, um, with MRCI and uh, with uh, neural network potentials. And this is the result. What would you think? Is this neural networks or is this uh, MRCI? What I have shown you now first. Just guess. Don't be so shy. Just uh, open your microphone and shout something. MRCI or a neural network is uh, not a problem. Just uh, to get you. A little bit more interactive. Uh, it uh, doesn't matter if you all shout at the same time because it's, it's just one word. I guess that this is a MRCI. Okay, very good. So it was a 50 50 ch chance. You could not know it's the neural network. Okay. Uh, but uh, thank you for participating. This is what I like. Very good. So, and uh, so this is what MRCI looks like. And you see it's a little bit more rugged. Why is this? Because with the neural network, this is really fast. So I've used 3,864 trajectories while I've used only 90 in the MRCI. Okay. And, and then, um, yes, then you um, how, how long does it take uh, dynamics? For example, uh, using MRCI and the machine learning, uh, the difference in time. Okay, I will come to that uh, uh, in a short while. I don't know by heart. Uh, so this, of course, uh, the MRCI takes much longer than the neural network. And I have it on a separate slide. I will show to you in a second. So okay. let's go quickly to this slide to answer your question, Danilo. So <laughs> um, just uh, to give you an idea, is uh, raised her hand, Natalia. Yes, Natalia. Hi, I, I have a uh, uh, Maybe it's some dumb question, actually. In the previous slide, uh, where you change the phases of the data to make you some better, to, to have this new, yeah, there. Uh, the input of this process you to in some output uh, before sorry before the output you need to put some correction to rightfully date date identify the uh, the, the points where you change the phases because that's is where I'm confused because if you change the phase how you can how you guarantee the program the program is con Considering this data as a dot from a inverted phase, and, uh, and not a dot 
uh, from a direct um, a direction memory. I, I don't know. If she, ah, okay. You could... So I think I get what you're asking. So you're asking uh, uh, how does the, the machine learning know uh, whether this is now the corrected uh, version or the uncorrected version? Is that yeah. what you're asking? Yes. And at, yes, right. Th that's so, the first part. And the second, how to, uh, well, sorry. Th I believe just understanding this first part, I can see the rest. Okay. Thanks. So um, this is something, this phase correction, this is something before we ever show the tr data to the machine learning. So this is some, so we do quantum chemistry and we do some post-processing. So this phase correction of uh, the quantum chemistry first, and only then, only the phase corrected data gets shown to the machine learning. So the machine learning never sees uh, this uh, version before. So this one, because we say, well, if we did, we get just uh, nonsense. If we if you just show this version to the machine learning, we do not get anything reasonable. So I think we have even tried that and it really is, yeah, we have tried that. You will see this also later. And um, so we show only this corrected version to the machine learning algorithm. Does this right. answer your question? Yes, yes, part of it's, it's because I don't, maybe I not understand uh the, the the final result of this program but my my love is okay if you fit the the database the for the machine learning um in this case if you uh it, it can result in some bad uh, how to say combination of orbital depending of the the property you are studying with this methodology. I mean, since he, you feed the the data the database with only uh, the uh, the in this case the up phase, and if you have a uh, inverted phase when it measure it, it won't crash it. Just the ah, okay. So you mean what I feed only this version where I have always red upstairs? What happens yes, if yes. I want to have uh, blue upstairs? Yes, thank you. Ah, okay. I'm so this is, this is something uh, uh, which uh, does not matter as long as you do everything consistently. So if you Look, for example, at uh, the energy. So you see, if I take red or blue, I get the same energy. So for the same state, it does not matter. So now, if I have uh, one coupling here, I have always as an input the wave function from one state and the wave function from the other state. So what can I have to get it consistent? I choose one of these uh, in the beginning because that's an output from a quantum chemistry. So I say, this is correct. And now, um, let's go back to have it consistent. If I have this here, I could have, uh, let's say also this version where I have blue upstairs, but then I also need to have the um, blue uh, in the other wave function here to get uh, the same uh, phase convention. And whether I have uh, always, uh, let's say the red stars or always the blue stars, uh, this, uh, usually gives the same results. Okay? Okay, thank you. Because uh, the uh, overall, you can choose one phase arbitrarily. 
like for the ground state you see it does not matter whether you choose only red or blue but once you have chosen red for example here then you need to choose the red the rest consistently philip there is, there is another question for you okay hi professor um I'm wondering if you if you can use uh, before uh, before you set the training da data, um, you you could um, you could uh, set an algorithm to predict this out uh, this out of phase as uh, outliers and then you 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 make these corrections bef uh, before uh, the the training data uh, learn how to how to um, interpret these data, you know? Mm -hmm. So, well, in principle, you could say, uh, yeah, if I have this uncorrect uh, thing, uh, some I just uh, tell the machine learning or I do a pre-processing that some of these are outliers. This is what you're saying, right? And uh, so then you would throw them away. Is that what you uh, would do? Because they are outliers or what would you do with them? Yeah. What? Yeah, uh, if the if the algorithm uh, interpreted interprets uh, these outliers, uh, these out of phase as outliers, and then make an automatic correction before the to generate actually the training data, so you could in principle automatize your algorithm. Mm -hmm. So I do not want to throw away any data because uh, computing these points is expensive. So I want to use them. So I rather use this phase correction approach, which is still uh, then cheaper. And I convert this thing from being, so to say, an outlier to not being an outlier. OK, this is what so I prefer. It, OK, so, so it's, it's cheaper to do this in a manual basis instead of an, automa an automated. Well, of course, we have some kind of automated version uh, to do that, but uh, I will show you yet another variant how to get around this uh, also with machine learning. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so we were here. Or is there another question? I'm happy about any question, right? Okay, so you see, uh, let's see whether I can answer Danilo's question, uh, which how fast is what, how fast is MRCI and uh, neural networks. But first I want to, to tell you, okay, this is the output uh, and I've plotted them one left, one right. So you do not really see how good is the neural network. And uh, would you say, is this a good agreement or not? And you could say, well, why hasn't he just overlaid the, two, the three curves from the left and the right? And um, I just want to give you an example of uh, um, how this dynamics looks. If I just change the basis set from this double theta basis set to another double theta basis set, and you see, well, it's not exactly the same, but qualitatively it is, right? But uh, so if somebody had told you before, uh, I did MRCI with this basis set or the same MRCI with uh, this other double theta basis set, is the dynamics different? Probably you would have said, well, should be the same. And this is the difference you get. So now I really plot the neural network in here. And to be really fair, I also only use 90 trajectories in the neural network. And you see, well, it really agrees better with uh, this solid line here on the data it was trained in principle than on the other one. And uh, it's much better agreement than the MRCI 631 G star. Uh, G uh, plus plus G star star with the uh, augmented uh, correlation consistent uh, double zeta here. Okay. So it really works. And now here is the answer to your question, Danilo. So 
With quantum chemistry, if I do 100 femtoseconds, it takes me 16 hours, or and with my neural network, eight minutes. But with my neural network, I can go up to one nanosecond, just for the fun of it, uh, for showing that it's possible. Doesn't really make sense for this molecule. And this would have taken 7,000 days in quantum chemistry and uh, in um, the neural network case, it took us uh, 59 days. Okay, does this answer your question, Daniel? No. Nope. Press, <laughs> <laughs> press the button. Press the button. Okay. So uh, is not press the button, but uh, one nanosecond is also very long. And uh, okay. And uh, for the fun, you see, we have only done two trajectories uh, this long, but. Uh, this is also nice uh, here, you know, sometimes uh, if you do trajectories, uh, sometimes uh, they die because uh, the quantum chemistry does not converge and uh, you just have to sort them out. With neural networks, usually they never break down. They may be unreasonable, but they never do not converge. Philip? Yes. And how long, how long does it take to, for training the machine? In uh, this case, uh, well, once you have the good training uh, set, it takes like uh, four or five hours. But uh, until you have really sort, until we had sorted out everything, we had trained this neural network like a uh, uh, hundred times. <laughs> okay. So, but uh, one training uh, with uh, these four thousand data points is uh, like four hours. That's, uh, but this hopefully uh, you do once. That's uh, the idea, which never works. Okay, thank you. Okay. So besides uh, this uh, nice uh, long dynamics, you can also do what you can do with uh, every quantum chemistry method in principle. So you can also optimize conical intersections. And uh, so, you see here two uh, coordinates, and uh, along these two coordinates, uh, here is the conical intersection for the S1, S0. And uh, uh, it has been optimized from the different hopping points of uh, different trajectories. So you see the gray things, these are hopping points from the different trajectories. and. Uh, um, here are, is the explanation of the different symbols. And you see the neural network also tells you where that the minimum energy conical intersection is at the same spot that uh, MRCI would tell you. Also for the S2, S1 conical intersection, it's at the same space. Of course, you need uh, to train your model first. So you might have uh, found uh, some of these conical intersections already during your training with quantum chemistry, but uh, in principle, it's possible. Okay. So now let's uh, get to another chapter and uh, look at neural networks versus kernel retrogression right now. So uh, to see how could perform different machine learning models. So we again look at this methylene ammonium cation, but now not only with the neural networks, but also with kernels. And we use different descriptors. So we use different inputs to our machine learning. What we never do is we never use um, just X, Y, Z coordinates. And the reason is that energies, so you probably know, if you shift your molecule in space, uh, the energy is still the same. Or if you rotate your molecule, the energy is still the same. So it's rotationally and uh, translationally invariant. And uh, we would like uh, that our input to our machine learning has the same property, should also be uh, invariant to rotations and translations. So instead of Cartesian coordinates, uh, we choose something else. 
we could use internal coordinates. They are rotationally and translationally invariant. But uh, what we had used before is the matrix of inverse distances. So we just uh, calculate uh, <coughs> the distance of uh, um, one atom uh, minus, uh, so the distance between one atom i and another atom j. And uh, then we invert this distance, and this is uh, the entry of a matrix. If we do this for every atom in the molecule, we obviously get a matrix. This is our input for our machine learning model that uh, you had seen so far. But we also use now uh, something which is called uh, an, the FCHL many body expansion. So, and these are just uh, letters of uh, last names of some people who have invented this. Uh, Faber, Christensen, Huang, and uh, von Lilienfeld. And uh, they include the positions in the periodic table. So at which row and which column of the periodic table uh, it is, that is a number and that in enters somehow. You in enter the distances, you enter angles, and if you want, you can enter even more. And that is basically uh, gives you something which then enters the machine learning algorithm as the input. Okay, just for you to know what it is. And uh, now in this kernel approach, uh, I had told you about kernel rich regression very quickly in the beginning. You maybe remember you had something like this. So you have an input, uh, some uh, exponential, for example, uh, which is uh, represented now by this k and some weights. And uh, this gives you, as an output, your property, for example, your energy. And doing just this sum, there's no way of having more than one output. So how do you know, now get several outputs because you have several excited state energies? So we have modified this and we have just expanded this whole thing with a second kernel, which includes just the states. We have three states in our model. So we have here just one, two, three inside. And now the, we have uh, different numbers of properties per compound C. Okay. And now let's see what comes out. <clears throat> so let's start with potential curves. So potential scans. So for example, the C and bond length um, <coughs> in this methylene ammonium cation molecule. And the quantum chemistry is still the MRCI. And you see these are the black lines. And if you now compare the red dashed or the blue dotted line, you would say, well, probably it's very similar. So everything works. If you zoom in a little, you see, well, the neural networks uh, a little bit closer here, but in principle, most of the time they're very much the same. And uh, also along this other coordinate, the rotation coordinate, uh, you see pretty much uh, very nicely reproduced uh, potentials by the machine learning model. So now let's look what happens in the dynamics. And uh, this is uh, what you've seen before. These are the neural networks with the uh, inverse distances. Uh, okay, nothing new here. So now what happens uh, if we take the kernel-rich regression and this FCHL representation, which should be even better, and you see it's a complete disaster. And if you go back and look at the potential to say, really? So is it really just this small energy difference here that makes uh, this difference or is it something else? So of course, what else do we need besides potentials uh, in order to get this dynamics? We do not only need potentials, we also need non-adiabatic couplings, right? So what we have done is to mix uh, the properties from the different models. So 
For example, we have done dynamics where the non-adiabatic couplings came from the neural networks and the energies and gradients from the kernel. And you see, well, it does not get better. And if we now invert it, if we take uh, the energies and gradients from the neural networks and the, the non-adiabatic couplings from the kernel, which are, by the way, also worse than the non-adiabatic couplings from the neural network, you see that the dynamics gets better, but is still not uh, where we want it to be. So in this sense, we see, well, we need some non-adiabatic couplings, and uh, ideally we need it to be correct, but uh, more importantly, we need really to get uh, the energies at these conical intersections uh, to be okay. Right? And we do not have a lot of margin. There is another question for you. Yes, please. Uh, hi, Philip. Uh, uh, it's me again. Sorry. Oh, sorry, hi. Max. Oh, you, do you want to make the question first and then? Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> do the question. Okay. Um, I want to know uh, how do you tune the hyperparameters from the kernel? Um, so. Very good. I have not talked about hyperparameters uh, so far. So, in principle, these are, if you go back to uh, the kernel thing, so in here we have some parameters like the width of uh, some Gaussians that we have used, and uh, we just do a so called random grid search. So, that means we train the model many times with uh, different parameters uh, that have to be adjusted manually and see which one gets better. And we do it in a random fashion such uh, that we do not really use a grid and uh, really search for every combination, but uh, randomly look uh, uh, which combination gives good value and then we iteratively uh, do uh, uh, in this range, which looks promising, uh, more uh, a finer grid, so to say, a finer scan of uh, parameters until we're happy. Okay, thank you, Philip. Uh, Welcome. Uh, my, my question is still uh, about the other slide of the kernel, just to just a curiosity, mm -hmm. this one. Um, I am just wondering if you have tried uh, to apply some individual models for each state instead of combining these two kernels, K1 and K2, uh, for different states. I mean, uh, in principle, uh, you could train one kernel for the state, uh, for the ground state, one individual kernel for the kernel model for the first excited state, and so on. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Yeah, yeah. very good question. Uh, we have done that. I have not that included in this presentation here, but if instead of uh, doing this expansion, we just use uh, uh, one separate mod kernel for the first state and then a very separate model for the next state, we get not as accurate as with this approach. And you see, even with this approach, we are still not accurate enough uh, to do the dynamics. But uh, in principle, it's possible to do it. And uh, uh, there are other people and other systems where it, uh, it works in principle to go ahead just training different models. Also, people do that with uh, neural networks for a new neural network for every state. But then I think this is very dangerous uh, because the neural network really, or the kernels in that case, really don't know about each other and is very easy to get uh, one curve for the one state that has a double crossing, which is wrong, something like we see sometimes in ADC2 calculations or uh, uh, DFT calculations if they converge. So that uh, the S1 state goes above the S2 state, so to say. Mm, yeah. And, yeah I uh, 
This can still happen if uh, you do it all in one model because there is no strict limitation that uh, the S1 has to stay be below the S2 state. Um, but it um, the at least the different uh, outputs uh, know about each other uh, in principle. Yeah, I guess that this crossing region should be the most difficult to train because there are a lot of uh, points with uh, similar energies. So in the when you mm -hmm. need to minimize the loss function, it should be problematic. I guess. Right. Okay. Thank you. So. Thank you for your question. So uh, you see in the end, uh, the neural networks uh, have performed uh, very nicely here. And uh, the kernel is uh, not performing so well in the dynamics. So we have not continued to use it. There are also other things uh, that we did not like so much about uh, them. Because for the excited states in our approach, uh, in order to train them, we needed uh, like one terabyte of uh, uh, RAM of uh, memory and um, that is uh, something we were allowed to use once or twice but not all the time and uh, because then the other people in the group could not run their calculations anymore and uh, so this is uh, if and this depends on the number of training points that you have and uh, 4000 is not a lot so if you want to go to larger molecules, you need more training points. And then at uh, some point, at least in this approach that we have used, it does not fit anymore into the memory of your machine. And uh, then it's over, right? But in principle, the learning of uh, these kernels is, uh, is better, scales better than the neural networks. So imagine this uh, like uh, the, somebody who, who is very talented, but uh, does not learn very well. So these are the neural networks in this case. Uh, so they already give good results uh, quite from the beginning. And if you get them more to learn, they, they learn, they get better, but uh, not as fast as the kernels. But the kernels are unfortunately not very talented at the beginning. So. Uh, they learn faster, but they still have not uh, experienced this crossing where they overtake uh, the neural networks. They have the capability to do so, but we need better computers until that happens. So in the future, it might be that uh, kernels are better than neural networks. Okay, there is another question, Natalia. Sorry. <laughs> Forgot to open the microphone. Uh, it's about this the the the, uh, the same thing I would say. Uh, as you said, to have a one terabyte all the time to train your model, it's some you know of this uh, in this type of methodology or model. And considering that, I mean, there are no there are multiple groups in the world who made who, who makes um, the same kind of um, analysis, and you can use it. Those oh sorry, sorry. Uh, you, you can use the uh, those uh, already calculated data to improve your model because so you, I mean, there are plenty of, uh, we can put on Google, like what's the potential of and the um, population of this specific um, uh, chemical system, but someone already made it, so you could use them. I, I, is, is it, <laughs> what, what's the problem? Why you, you can do this? for, in this case, what's okay. the main So are you asking about uh, if I could just use uh, quantum chemistry data from other people and then train it? Yeah. 
Por so, exemplo, meio yeah. que a database with some point of works already described the population of some uh, alcoholic system, okay? Mm -hmm. And then use them to modulate your system. Then you should reduce at least the time of calculation for for the, the, the database man, for, for the machine learning. Right. So this is something which is very desirable. And uh, unfortunately, there are not so many databases uh, right now uh, for excited states. Um, but people are going in this direction and uh, for the ground state more and more people gather uh, really uh, data and uh, share them so that you can train models without doing the quantum chemistry yourself but um, still in this case uh, the problem that i've talked about now was that you still need to train your model you take all the data from the other people nicer but uh, now you want to learn the correct weights and this takes a lot of uh, memory already and uh, yes. oh. no it's because my main um my main doubt about this is actually i don't understand almost nothing about machine learning I'm learning here no now in those lectures and whatever because it's interesting and but in our case uh, I, I'm really concerned about the uh, the overfitting. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, uh, I have the strongest this I mean, <laughs> if you change some metal, you have to find this some magical functional that will um, maybe will function better if I met our computational model. And then I think, man, oh my gosh, this is already difficult to do DFT. And how about machine learning? Uh, how we avoid to do this overfeeding? That, that's when I can understand how to avoid it or the mm -hmm. methodologies to okay. correct. If you want it. to avoid overfitting, this is uh, something where, in principle, you uh, um, well, unfortunately, I don't have a picture right now, or maybe. Well, no, this takes too long now. But um, in principle, so overfitting is you go through every point, even if it is an outlier or noise, and uh, um, you fit a lot of wiggles instead of uh, a straight line when actually it should be a straight line, for example, right? So, and this you can, of course, have also in machine learning. And there are different ways around it. So what you should do is something that is called cross-validation. So what you do is you take all your data and you split it into something that is called training data and something that is called uh, test data. And uh, this uh, overall training data you split again into um, um, the training data for uh, the first run and some validation data. So you train on this, uh, let's say, this first bit, which is really your training data. And uh, so the machine learning model sees this training data. And then you uh, have your model and you let it predict the values from the validation data set. So, of course, uh, this is like uh, you know already the answer and you ask uh, the student, in that case, the machine learning model, what is the correct answer, right? And because you know, um, you see how good uh, this uh, machine learning model is, how good the student is, and you give it a grade and you say, okay, this one is good and this one is bad, so I take the good one, right? And, um, or I change a hyperparameter in that case. And, uh, for example, I change uh, uh, in a neural network, how many neurons do I take? Because that is something I have to define beforehand. So now I change more, I take more neurons, I train the whole thing again, and I see my uh, training data gets predicted uh, better. And uh, then in the end, when I'm happy, I still have 
a bias because I have adapted to the number of uh, uh, neurons in my neural network such that the validation data is nicely uh, represented. Okay. And um, uh, so I do a last uh, test on my test set that I have never shown uh, to uh, any machine learning so far and see whether it works. And only if this works, then I go ahead and uh, use my machine learning model. And then I hopefully do not overfit. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So let's continue with Schnark. So that's our uh, newest machine learning approach, which uh, corrects for some of the things that uh, we have done so far. And it's a convolutional neural network inside. So what is a convolutional neural network? It's something that uh, has been used for image processing uh, originally, where your number of inputs uh, can become extremely high. So, of course, if you have an image, you have uh, so many pixels. In this case, 1024 times 577 pixels in this uh, nice cat that wants to be a shark because, well, sharks are cool, right? And um, so you have so many input nodes here times three because you have uh, R, G, B, okay? You have these pixels. So this is how image data is stored. So imagine only this first line being not uh, like this many, but like uh, 1.5 million. Imagine uh, that uh, this would be quite expensive to train and uh, to do predictions. I guess you imagine it, right? So what can you do to uh, reduce the whole thing? So what you do is something which is called convolution of small filters. So imagine this is now our uh, Nice picture, it's uh, simplified a lot, right? And uh, now what do I do? I take this and I put my filter on top of this part and my filter looks maybe like that. So I multiply this one with this one and this one with this one and so on. And I add all these values up. So I have one times one and so on. And uh, I see if I add all these numbers together, I get four. Okay, so that's one convolution. And now I swipe my filter over my, um, my picture and I get all these different numbers. And you see that's the first convolution and uh, my network or my neurons get uh, much, much less. So I have a, my network becomes smaller. Okay, this is how a convolutional neural network works. You can also have uh, something like pooling. So you uh, put uh, something into slices and you look, for example, in here, this uh, red area, what is the highest number? And I only take this highest number. So in this green area, the highest number is the eight. So I take that one. In this yellow area, the highest number is the three and so on. This is another variant how to reduce stuff. And uh, what is often done is uh, to com combine that. And in the end, uh, use uh, this original fully connected uh, neural network like we had before. And uh, then that is how this convolutional neural network works. Now we want to do something very similar <coughs> for our molecules. And uh, you've seen uh, here these filters uh, in this standard convolutional neural networks are just a bunch of numbers, right? So if you apply this now to the positions of a molecule, multiplying with a bunch of numbers, this is kind of 
pixelated, right? So you cannot represent everything nicely because you have uh, this number. So this needs to be smooth. Instead of uh, kind of pixels, you want to have smooth filters. And of course you can do that, right? It's just uh, from the machine learning side, um, a different way of implementing it. You can of course replace uh, um, a lot of integer numbers or uh, pixel numbers with smooth functions. And then you get continuous filters. And this is what uh, this architecture that is described in these papers uh, does. And we employ this one now for excited states. So uh, we adapt this architecture that is called Schnet for excited states and combined with shark and then we call it schnark. So what does it have? It has advanced descriptors so we do not use anymore this inverse distances and it has an atomistic model. I will talk about that uh, uh, in a few seconds. Okay and um, so then we have the non-adiabatic couplings vectors and we have uh, uh, a faceless loss and it's still faster than the one we had before. So what do we do now? We have um, the descriptor is now, if we look at this, we use uh, the properties as sum of atomistic contributions. For example, the energies are now just the sum of atomic energies. And you would say, well, how do I get atomic energies? This is decided really by the neural network itself. So what you do is you take a molecule or a set of atoms and um, you take look only at one of them in an environment of neighboring atoms and you make a cutoff. So everything that is in the cutoff gets considered. And uh, you do that for every atom in your molecule and uh, put everything into a separate neural network uh, for every different element that uh, is possible. And all of these together, they get uh, then uh, combined and then you get a first set of neural networks that is basically your descriptors and a second set of neural networks which takes the output of these ones, for example, to predict energies or dipoles. And uh, then you go ahead and uh, fit everything. And uh, you see that, uh, that uh, if you want now covariant non-adiabatic couplings, you go back and you cannot just use uh, this fitting because non-adiabatic couplings should be vectors. And uh, like, uh, what we had done so far is something rotationally and translationally invariant. So if you look at the energies, for example, here's an energy. And if you rotate the molecule, the energy is still the same. So it's like a dot. If you rotate a dot, you cannot make any difference, right? Now, what is it with forces? If you rotate the forces, they should be covariant. So if you rotate the molecule, also the forces should rotate with them, right? Like this. And um, so how do we do that in principle in neural networks? How does everybody who does dynamics do it? Um, you just take the derivative of your neural network that represents energies and that is your forces like you do in uh, quantum chemistry as well. So the forces are the derivatives of the energies. Okay, and this can be done quite easily in these implementations. So we take the same thing with, uh, uh, and okay, I forgot this. In principle, you can train a neural network only on this thing and uh, still get something nice. So we do the same thing for the non-adiabatic coupling vectors. So we train the non-adiabatic couplings as the derivative of a neural network. Then this is covariant. So the neural network itself, what does it train then? If you uh, have forces, then you train on energies. If you want uh, non-adiabatic couplings, well, 
You train on nothing that is really known. It's the antiderivative of uh, the non-adiabatic coupling vectors, but it's something you can do. So you never have this quantity. You train on this and it works. And now the NAC vectors are covariant. So this is something which is inside Schnack. Yet another property is uh, that we can now use approximated non-adiabatic couplings. So in principle, non-adiabatic couplings are computed like this, right? So you have the derivative of the wave function times the wave function and integrated. So it's uh, basically this equation here. And probably you know that these non-adiabatic couplings are very peaky, so you can get them non-peaky if you multiply with uh, the delta E. You see, if the delta E gets uh, zero, then this gets very tall, this very big, this quantity. So you can get it rather smooth by multiplying it with the energy difference. Okay, nice. So this is what we predict actually. And we use the energies from the neural network in order to get everything nice. <coughs> and now we can approximate these non-adiabatic couplings because there is this formula. Don't ask me where it comes from. You can find it in the, in the literature. Of course, you can derive it. And um, so in there, you see there is the Hessian of uh, the difference potential. So we have the energies and you need the Hessian. And probably you know that computing the Hessian is something quite expensive, but since computing potentials with neural networks is very cheap, we can still do it, okay? So we take this formula, which has only the square of the, uh, the non-adiabatic coupling vectors that we uh, want, and we do a singular value decomposition, take the largest eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector, and then uh, the uh, non-adiabatic coupling vector that we want is uh, basically this eigenvector times uh, this eigenvalue divided by the energy difference. And so you see, we can calculate non-adiabatic couplings by using the Hessian of uh, um, the uh, potentials. And then we do not need to calculate the non-adiabatic couplings anymore. And we also don't need quantum chemistry data for uh, non-adiabatic couplings anymore, which is nice. So we can do that, for example, for a linear vibronic coupling model of SO2. So a very simple model of SO2. And you see um, the straight line is the original data. And uh, if we just learn this data with uh, machine learning, we have the dashed curves. And if we use the approximated non-adiabatic couplings, so these ones here, uh, the dotted ones, we get it. And we can also do that for uh, non-adiabatic couplings between triplets, for example. And you see, it looks even better than the ones we had learned. Looks get, uh, gets closer to the original data. And then we can dynamics and we see, well, in principle, qualitatively, it works with these approximated non-adiabatic couplings. So you see, this is the original dynamics. If you have only singlets here, you have uh, an S1 and uh, S2. Nothing much happens here. Also here, nothing much happens. And if you include triplets, uh, you have uh, uh, inter-system crossing to the triplets. So the S1 gets depopulated and uh, uh, the triplets get populated. And uh, let's say roughly the same as the data that we want. OK, now we still have a phaseless loss in Schnark. This is also nice. So we do not need this phase correction, this pre-processing that we have talked about before anymore. So what we do now is we take uh, the loss as the minimum of uh, a value for the coupling. And we try out many different phases just uh, that are possible. So in principle, imagine 
if you, you have uh, two states, then you can have uh, this combination plus uh, one and minus one, and you can have uh, uh, plus one and plus one, and uh, uh, now you don't know which one of these is uh, the one that you really want. Okay, so you try out all these different combinations. So you multiply your first output of the quantum chemistry either with nothing or you multiply it with, uh, with this one with minus one. And you try out what is the error if you take uh, the first combination, if you take the second combination, and if you have more states, you need to do two to the power of uh, number of states possible combinations, but uh, it can be done. And uh, then you get uh, here the error or the squared error. And uh, basically um, what you do is you multiply it with uh, minus one or plus one, all the possible combinations that you have, and uh, look at all these different errors. And you take the one where it's the least and uh, you continue. And then, well, let's see what happens. So this is the standard loss that we had before. So not this faceless loss, this new one, but the standard that we had in the very beginning. And you see with face corrected data, we reproduce the dynamics nicely. Now, if you take the raw quantum chemistry data, this was also a question before, then it does not work. <clears throat> So this is not face corrected and the, this normal loss function, it simply does not work. If we now take this faceless loss, we can train it on the raw quantum chemistry data and it reproduces the dynamics and we can also use it on the face corrected uh, quantum chemistry data and it also works. So this is nice. And uh, last point, uh, the timings in this new implementation are even faster. So the original one, you remember, one nanosecond uh, with quantum chemistry was the 7,000 days, which is also 19 years. We could do it in 59 days. Now with this Schnark, we can do it in three days. So it's really much faster. And um, well, unfortunately to train it, takes much longer, but still below a day for this model, right? So um, I would say if one wants to run long dynamics, it's still worth it. Okay, and no, I don't want to go to the bonus. I think we have uh, done enough for today. So let's come to the summary and uh, so one take home message, because that's enough. Uh, nanosecond excited state dynamics with machine learning is possible. And uh, so that could lead the way for uh, unraveling many photoreaction mechanisms uh, that happen on long time scales. That's exciting. And I hope uh, we will see more of that in the future. So, and if you want to do that, uh, you can use Schnark and find it uh, uh, at this uh, GitHub address. So, so if you take away one thing, it's the nanosecond machine learning excited state dynamics from this whole thing. That's uh, my final slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. It was in, it's impressive how fast this can be. And I think uh, to teach um, to teach the machine you must be a very smart teacher. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, if you have any other questions, please, Antonio, go ahead. Um, thank you, Professor Philip, for the very uh, amazing talk. Um, you mentioned that some of your descriptors that you use as inputs for the neural networks um, should uh, be rotational invariant and um, um, translational invariant. 
But the, the system that you study has four hydrogen atoms, and the energy should be also uh, invariant with respect to the permutation of these identical atoms. Is that an issue? Would uh, consider that on your model uh, improve something? Right. So in principle, that's an issue that you should uh, think about. You're very right. And uh, this Schnark approach has it inside because it's an atomistic uh, model. So. Well, I do not want to go in here, so let's go back um, to Can you still see my screen? Yes, but it is on a slide called computation of UV spectra. Yeah, yeah, right. So I want to go to this one here. So you see it in full screen again? No, I think it's... Um, okay, so you see something now or not? Um, slide number uh, 100. It's frozen there, I guess. Okay, okay wait. I will go ahead and uh, share it again. So here, yeah. you see it now, right? Yeah. So now what we use in Schnark is this atomistic model. So for every element, we have uh, basically an input so, and a cutoff. So uh, that means that um, um, since this is for every element, um, every hydrogen has the same input structure, so to say. Uh, it can have different environments, so the neural network that describes this part uh, uh, can uh, cope for that, but if you have uh, exactly the same environment, then it also gives the same atomistic energy for this hydrogen, and they are just summed together in the end to give the overall energy. So it is uh, regarding this permutational symmetry. The original model, this uh, neural networks uh, with the nanosecond dynamics uh, in the Theonor implementation, that did not respect it, but still worked very well. So, um, but uh, Schnark is uh, even better. So it is respected here. Okay. And uh, you were using um, adiabatic uh, representation. Would it be easier for the neural network fits to use a diabatic potential in the surface because they, they would be smooth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great, but uh, you don't get uh, the diabatic potentials for free, right? And uh, um, as long as you give me the diabatic potentials, I rather learn the diabatic ones. Okay, they're more troubled in their worth. Yeah, so is the question, is it really worth it? Um, if you want to do quantum dynamics, yes, you need them. And, uh, and then you have to go through the trouble of diabetizing. But uh, here for surface hopping, we don't really need it. And uh, so we stay in the adiabatic representation. If, uh, so there are people who try to do the diabetization also with the machine learning. But uh, until now, uh, what they have done is uh, diabetize uh, mostly, uh, um, yeah, let's say two state systems where you just uh, use the rotation matrix to go to the diabetic representation. And uh, so very simple diabetizations in the end. So I'm not yet convinced by any model that does a good diabetization. And we have uh, uh, done work on it and have not achieved something where we are happy with so far for larger molecules. 
Okay, and my, le my last question is concerning the sampling. You showed us how the adaptive sampling uh, works, but I was mm -hmm. curious about the first points. How do you sample them? Do you just take them from the tra trajectories or do you use some kind of regularization or something because they're, they're mm -hmm. important? Okay, so the first points, um, there are different approaches. What we have done in the past is either use a weakness sampling or we have done normal mode scans or uh, what uh, we are trying now also is uh, just doing um, uh, optimizations of conical intersections because these points obviously are very um, uh, important. So these are basically, if you optimize for a conical intersection with quantum chemistry, this is a very specific scan, right? Not along a normal mode, but uh, towards something that you might really need. And uh, what else uh, you could do is uh, running uh, meta dynamics in the ground state. That also is a good approach. Uh, and um, then from these sample points uh, do uh, quantum, uh, excited state calculations or <coughs> the worst I would say is uh, just running classical MD in the ground state with the force field and sampling I don't know every hundredth point to do um, um, then uh, excited state calculations but so there are many approaches. And I would say if you do scans uh, towards uh, conical intersections with your uh, quantum chemistry, plus some metadynamics uh, in the ground state and uh, choose these different uh, um, points as uh, your starting point that uh, at your initial set and then do adaptive sampling afterwards, uh, I think that's probably one of the best approaches you can take. Okay, and uh, the surface that you end up with is, is is it um, large enough to be called global or the trajectories always sample the same re regions and you have a local uh, surface? Well, this very much depends on your dynamics because this adaptive sampling, of course, uh, only goes to regions where you go uh, can go in principle with the dynamics mostly. And um, then I would not yet uh, call it the potential energy surfaces a global, but uh, they are, uh, they include at least the important regions. This I would say. So I would not call them global, but uh, sufficient. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other question? No? So I thank you again, Philip. It was a very, very nice talk. I mean, I, I could call it a short introduction to machine learning. It's a kind of a Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I hope now you have a, but, uh, a better insight into machine learning and what you can do. OK. Just a word of caution as uh, the last words. Uh, OK, of course, I presented as uh, usually everybody does uh, the clean uh, and nice and uh, uh, great results. But um, if you do that, uh, you need to be prepared to train your model over and over again and uh, hassle until you have a nice training set and a nice, <coughs> uh, a nice model, machine learning model. And uh, that, uh, of course, takes also time. So it takes a lot of human time still at the moment so if you only want to do uh, short dynamics, I would still go for the standard ab initio molecular dynamics. Okay, thank you. I, and I guess that you are going to receive a lot of input <coughs> from the audience. You caught the attention of everybody. Congratulations, Phil, for this very nice work. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. And thank you for the invitation. Okay, you are always welcome. Thank you. Now, I just want to share with you the announcement for our next seminar. So, this is going to be the last one of this year. And then we are going to restart next year in January, okay? 
the next one will be with uh, Daniel from Valencia, one of my favorite plays. And he's going to talk about caspity due determinations of molar extinction coefficient, coefficients in condensed phase. There it is, Daniel. I think that you, most of you know him. Daniel from Valencia. He was, I think, one of the last students that Luis supervised, I think. And he's going to talk about the extinction coefficients in condensed phase. So I just call your attention that the seminar is going to be 2.30 p.m. because he, is, he has a lot of teaching and he's going to, to give the seminar after his last class. So everybody is welcome and I hope to be with you next Friday again. Okay, but I will send you the invitation soon. So again, thank you very, everybody. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you all for being with us today. I hope you have a very nice weekend. And again. Thank you. Okay. Also a nice weekend to you. I think he will, he will, he can answer you. See you people. Bye. <laughs>